Ну а мы вернемся к роли искусственного интеллекта в медицине. Back to the role of artificial intelligence in healthcare. We will, of course, have to touch upon one of the most relevant topics: the coronavirus pandemic. Artificial intelligence can and should relieve the load on healthcare systems across the globe. Spermed A have created a computer imaging uh, solution, uh, lungs computer imaging, based on AI. And this is the model that is used in uh, clinics and hospitals in 50% of Russian regions as part of the international competition on AI for school children. One of the, tri one of the tasks was about medical imaging processing with AI. And now I'd like to give the floor to Bertalan Mesko, doctor and specialist in clinical genomics, and Yuri Kristinsky, head of Colleagues, friends, by developing the healthcare stream in the ecosystem, we obviously focus a lot on AI technologies as part of AI Institute, as part of uh, the uh, same named lab and uh, the Spermat AI, the special lab created together with Spermatech and Skoltech. We are developing the technologies that will eventually help our patients uh, to be better diagnosed uh, when they first come to the hospital, to the clinic, uh, prevent uh, the uh, medical errors during the uh, treatment stage, and in the end to help our clients and our patients to manage their health in a more efficient manner. We are only starting, we are, have only embarked on the war this way, and which is very exciting and very promising. And today we are going to talk about the outlook for AI. Uh, um, in healthcare, with uh, a great speaker, Bertalan Meshko, professor, futurist in healthcare, and the head of an institute of uh, the healthcare of the future. We are going to show you a small video that was recorded just before our event, and then Bertalan will be available for the Q&A. So. Welcome. It's such a pleasure for me to take part at this event in Moscow, AI Journey. My name is Dr. Bertalan Meshko. I'm the Medical Futurist and I lead the Medical Futurist Institute where we constantly analyze what's going to happen to healthcare because of advanced technologies. So in this very short talk today, I will describe three stages. The stage before the pandemic began, then what's going on because of the pandemic, and the new normal after the pandemic ends, while focusing on the benefits, the advantages, the risks of artificial intelligence in medicine and healthcare. So let's see digital health after COVID. Even before the pandemic began, science fiction was sneaking into our lives. Printing out a structural house in less than a day with a 3D printer? Of course, it became a possibility. There are Chinese and American companies doing this already. Going to work? Putting on an exoskeleton to lift huge weights in that robotic structure as part of your everyday job? Yes, that's what happened in South Korea in the ship factory. Or sitting in driverless cars, driving us around without us controlling everything? Even trucks roaming around in Europe can do that already. Science fiction is in our lives, at least was in our lives, before the pandemic began. And that's what we at the Medical Future is focused on. We try to do what archaeologists do, but in the opposite direction. Archaeologists look at trends, data, stories and fossils, and they try to envision the past. We do the same based on trends, data and stories, but we try to envision the future. And the vision we try to imagine before the pandemic began was full of amazing advanced technologies being used for medical and healthcare purposes. 
smartwatches and health sensors using artificial intelligence to make better decisions for us. It was amazing. A smartwatch with an ECG can detect if a patient has a higher risk for stroke. The algorithm can let the patient know about that and they can ask for medical help. Uh, robots roaming around in hospitals, disinfecting hospital rooms, and other robots that can be used in pharmacies and supply chains have been part of healthcare already. If you look at 3D printing, you find areas like dentistry or uh, printing out um, equipment, prosthetics, customized prosthetics for patients. It was a, a real industry skyrocketing into the future. We saw that bioprinting was becoming a real issue that the chance to print, to use a 3D printer to print out biomaterials like bone, cartilage, later liver tissue, sometimes in the future kidney tissue, it was like science fiction becoming real. If you looked at pharmacies and pharma companies, it became clear that artificial intelligence could contribute to drug design, drug repurposing, using robots behind the pharmacy walls, using artificial intelligence in in silico clinical trials, maybe giving a chance not to test medications on patients anymore. And just one last thing, robotic structures, exoskeletons and other technology-based solutions became available for patients worldwide. It was not cheap yet, but the trends were amazingly promising before the pandemic. We analyzed that, all those trends and how the whole situation in healthcare was changing. And it was clear that a cultural transformation was going on. In the 21st century, the ivory tower of medicine started breaking down, which means not only physicians in that ivory tower could access information, technology, data, but patients could do the same. So the newest member of the medical team became patients, the most underused resource of healthcare. We, we interviewed really forward-looking, empowered patients and physicians globally, and we found that they see their own doctor-patient relationship in a different view because of using AI and such technologies. They felt that instead of the, the old hierarchy of the traditional doctor-patient relationship, where only physicians can access the data, the interfaces and the knowledge, but patients cannot do any of these things. Instead of that, let's create a partnership where they can look at the same data, the same interfaces together, trying to find the best medical decisions for a patient's case. That was the cultural transformation that was going on already. Of course, that cultural transformation is the one we call digital health. And digital health on the long term makes patients the point of care. That was the story we like to tell before the pandemic. And that was just the, the, the basic part of the story. What was really exciting is looking into the near future. All right, of course, patients and physicians should be equal partners, but what about the use of really advanced technologies? A robot taking a blood sample from a patient, an algorithm making a medical decision, a patient using an AI-based service like Skin Vision to take photos of their skin lesions to analyze whether they have a risk for skin cancer. Those were in use already. And when you start thinking about the use of these advanced technologies, you also realize that it's not just about using that technology, it's about the cultural components of that change. Even if I decide to sit down and allow a robot to take my blood sample because it can be more efficient, it can make the whole process more comfortable, all right, based on evidence-based medicine, but I will still need someone, a healthcare professional, to comfort me in the process. But there were such issues that we at the Medical Futurists were thinking about. And it makes sense to dedicate time to such futuristic visions, because if we look at certain stories like the stethoscope story, you realize how, how much time it takes for us, medical professionals and patients, to adopt technologies. Just a very short story about the stethoscope, one of the simplest technologies in medicine. Before, in, in, about 200 years ago, that's how we listened to cardiac and lung sounds. We physicians had to put their ears to the back or chest of patients. And then the French physician Lennec came up with the first gadget idea, a hollow wooden tube that would augment the sound that they could hear. Nobody wanted to use it. It took him about 30 years to get this message across because medical associations worldwide claimed that they didn't want to use a gadget while practicing the art of medicine. In contrast, today, if this technology is around your neck, 
you must be a medical professional. The stethoscope has become the symbol of being a physician. So eventually, we adopted it. But today there are digital stethoscopes using AI to even analyze the cardiac and lung sound that physicians can hear. You see, before we had 30 years to adopt one medical innovation, and now 30, if not 30,000 innovations come out every single day. Nobody is physically prepared to adopt these changes, but that's how fast medicine was changing even before the pandemic began. That was the picture. That's how we saw digital health and the cultural transformation and the role of advanced technologies in all that before 2020. And then the pandemic took place. Everything changed. In a matter of weeks, if not months, in early 2020, millions of patients and medical professionals worldwide started adopting technologies because not out of choice, but must, but there was no other choice. They could either, either deliver or receive healthcare through telemedical services, or they couldn't. That's quite a motivation to start adopting technologies. Telemedicine, at-home lab tests, a lot of other technologies became parts of our lives. Elderly homes worldwide started adopting home sensors to use the Internet of Healthy Things as a network of devices for full protection and for preventing diseases and medical conditions from happening for elderly patients at their homes because they couldn't go to the point of care. Telemedicine started becoming the new norm. Uh, health services through smartphone apps, video chat services started finally taking place and finding their own place in healthcare. Physicians had to find their new environment within hospital buildings where they could calmly provide medical help from afar. And we patients started learning how to ask for such medical help through these telemedical services. Chatbots uh, skyrocketed because of the notion that if, we, if I cannot meet a medical professional in person, at least let's have, let's have a, some form of conversation with a chatbot based, of course, AI controlled service to have a sense of talking to someone. In the UK, it became clear that many patients had to wait a lot to meet a mental health professional. But while they were waiting, sometimes for weeks, they received a chatbot-based service. Of course, patients knew that it was only a chatbot, but it was still some level of comfort. And when they could finally meet a healthcare professional in person, the chatbot could create a profile, a report about the patient's case. Many smartphone apps and services came out becoming available about how to adjust your diet, your lifestyle, how to exercise more, how to choose the right, how to make the right food choices based on your lifestyle insights, molecular background, uh, genetic needs, anything that could be accessible through your own data and that could lead to better decisions. Again, without even going physically to the point of care. Many technologies started using artificial narrow intelligence. Skin vision, to analyze skin lesions uh, through the photos patients can take with their smartphone. Other services like Headspace and Calm, where mental health was in the focus. Many of these services start implementing AI to continue adjusting the service they can provide for their users. And that's only possible through machine learning based systems. And last thing here, even at-home lab tests started becoming the new norm. Because when you can't even go to the point of care, or you can go but you have to wait with other sick people for a sample you can also provide from home, then of course it became clear that there is a business need for at-home lab tests. That's the kind of new norm uh, we've seen being created by the day because of these skyrocketing digital health trends. But a point I'm trying to make here is that why the technological adoption from patients and physicians finally took place in just weeks or months in 2020, the cultural transformation is still lagging behind. Even if everyone in the world gets access to a healthcare service through a telemedical technology, it doesn't mean that they can still build the right relationship that is at the core of practicing medicine with their healthcare professionals. So now, if we cannot put the cultural transformation that we foresee even before the pandemic next to that technological adoption, I'm afraid we might have a chance to lose what really matters in healthcare. The, the real-life connection between healthcare professionals and patients, the trust, the, the empathy, the compassion, those core values that really 
are the most important features of practicing medicine. When we ask the world's most forward-looking patients what they would like to see in the future of their doctor-patient relationships, they ask for the same three things – attention, empathy and time. Not more AI or more health sensors and smartwatches, but the core values. Although, to use these core values is only possible through the use of these advanced technologies, but that's how the technological and the cultural transformations can complement each other. So, to give you a vision about how we see now the new norm, why the pandemic is still going on, it should be around the idea that digital health can make patients the point of care. And why they are the point of care, they should still be connected to their healthcare institutions, the hospital buildings, the medical practices, uh, even the ambulances. Through technologies we can all use, like uh, the digital cloud, which means that even if I have a hardware, a medical portable diagnostic device that has an algorithm built in, it can become better by every use. It can make better decisions on the long term because of the digital cloud. They can still improve the algorithm's efficiency through that cloud-based services. We can look at health sensors and how variable devices can help patients access the data they already had but didn't have means to access it. Smartphone connected ECGs, smartwatches, health sensors, anything that can lead to better decisions and lifestyle insights. We've seen a rise in portable diagnostic devices. Just look at the, the digital stethoscopes or the portable ultrasound device that now has built-in artificial intelligence guidance, meaning that it's simply mind-blowing, that you don't even have to be a professional ultrasound examiner to examine someone through an ultrasound device because the AI guides you through it. It's like science fiction is becoming real in front of our eyes. And then, of course, it's only possible, all this will only be possible with the use of a centralized artificial intelligence-based system. Machine learning and deep learning-based algorithms helping us make better decisions on the go. Because when we use all these technologies, it's really easy to get lost, to feel doomed. And when it comes to using medical robots, it's gonna be even worse. So, while they can benefit from accessing that much data, I can tell you by experience, it makes you more anxious. And if you, even if you have a partner physician in this process, it's not enough. You need something, an advanced technology, to make to get the meaning out of that huge bunch of data we can measure about ourselves and a bunch of data our medical professionals and healthcare systems can obtain about ourselves now. Of course, that's only possible through artificial intelligence. So while for many years I've been hearing professionals saying that, healthcare professionals, that AI might get, might remove the art of medicine from their work, I think it's vice versa. Now, AI provides the right hope for us to make sure we will know what to do in this jungle of digital and health information. And that's the hope I'm talking about here. Let's talk about the near future, the new norm after the pandemic ends. Because have no doubts, we will beat this pandemic through vaccinations, but we have to take time now and dedicate enough efforts to finding out and foreseeing what that new norm might be like very soon. I think to be able to orientate ourselves in that new norm, we need a, a baggage with three things inside. The first thing is a skill. It's called forecasting. It's about the idea that if I look at trends and data, I would be able to extrapolate from today's trends into the near future. Of course, that has been the job of futurists like myself, but I think now everyone has to become a little bit of a futurist themselves. If you have doubts about the importance of forecasting, just let me point out that the very first report about a potential outbreak in Wuhan came out from a Canadian AI startup called Blue Dot, not even the World Health Organization themselves. So even the, an AI was the first to predict the outbreak than any healthcare or public health organizations worldwide. That, that's pretty impressive. So forecasting has to become a part of our major skill set. You have to deal with the, 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 the sense that if you look at data, you can make better decisions for the near future. If you think it's a skill that's hard to improve, just go to a free community site I use myself. It's called the Good Judgment Project. It's a very friendly, supportive community where you can answer, you can forecast geopolitical, cultural, sports questions. 
Your job is just to give an estimation of how you think that event might unfold. And the more you do that, the better you will become at forecasting. I guarantee you that. The second thing that we need in this baggage for the near future is, um, is an idea or approach. It's called patient design. It means whatever you do, you shouldn't be able to, to develop something for patients without actively involving them in the process. Patient design means you involve patients on the highest level of decision making in your organization. Even the Food and Drug Administration in the US, that's the worst leading healthcare regulatory body, has a patient advisory board. Now medical associations, pharma companies have patient advisory boards. And the third thing we need in this baggage is your data. I'm afraid there is no AI revolution without your precious data, without your medical records, without your the data coming from your smartphone, your smartwatches, your health apps, your lifestyle insights. I know it sounds awful, but it's literally impossible to develop AI-based algorithms for medical and healthcare purposes without you. That comes with a level of breach of your privacy. The question is not whether it's possible, it's not. We cannot improve AI without losing some of our privacy. The question we have to ask ourselves is how much of our privacy we are willing to give up in exchange for a chance for a longer and healthier life. And if, if you are the one making the decision, I think ethically you should be fine. When someone else is making the decision for you, your employer, health insurance or pharma company or healthcare government, that's a different scenario then. But let's say out loud, without losing our privacy, there is no AI revolution. But with that, with these three things, we could finally orientate ourselves in this jungle of technologies, genetic test reports, health sensors, portable diagnostic devices, and artificial intelligence. But with that vision becoming a reality, why patients become, are, are becoming the point of care, we have to say out loud that we would allow people to, to live their lives to the fullest, not deal with medical conditions for decades, analyzing their data and managing disease and health for decades, but in allowing them to enjoy life, do what they are the best of. But in the meantime, I think it would be important to use all these technologies to give them a chance for a longer and healthier life. So if I can summarize all these things in one vision, one image that we share at The Medical Futurist, it's this one. The doctor-patient relationship should have no interfaces, no more technologies, just two people having a real-life conversation, building trust with empathy and compassion. But in the meantime, they should be surrounded by advanced, seamless, invisible technologies, health sensors, portable diagnostic devices, genetic test reports, uh, analytical uh, services and AI in the cloud, making sure that we can deal with that amount of data. No human being can do that, but artificial narrow intelligence is capable of that. Well, I think that's a vision that's worth fighting for. So thank you so much for your very kind attention, and I very much look forward to the live Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Meshko was just here on the air. Thank you for having me. Uh, for having a great day. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting speech. Uh, I've prepared several questions. Uh, first one, of course, you know the implementation of AI uh, generates various fears, one of which is associated with the fear of doctors in regards to their professional future. Uh, would you say AI would lead to the reduction of medical staff? That's the most common question anyone can get whether AI would replace medical professionals. I'm absolutely against this idea. I think AI cannot replace medical professionals. However, those medical professionals that use AI would replace those medical professionals that do not. That's how simple it is. AI, even if we talk about artificial general intelligence, somewhere in the, the far-fetched future, decades away from today, even artificial general intelligence might not be able to replace what a physician can do. I mean, Let's be theoretical here. If an artificial general intelligence entity can do the same things as a physician can do, empathy is still missing because empathy is reflective. And if a patient doesn't trust 
uh, a physician or an AI entity, they won't feel empathy coming from them. Mm. We are social beings. So even if an AI entity could bring so much value into a doctor-patient relationship, I still firmly believe that at the end of the day, doctors, human beings will have to be the ones making the final decisions and helping patients guide them through this jungle of information. So, uh, do we convince the medical community uh, that AI really works uh, and doesn't threaten them in terms of their professional future? That's a very important question to ask. Thank you so much for that. I think there is only one way to, to persuade the medical community, really one way, to evidence-based medicine. If a company developing, producing an AI-based medical technology or any AI-based algorithms working for healthcare purposes, if they can build or create enough proof through peer-reviewed studies and clinical trials, medical professionals will be convinced. We are simple people. If I read something in a peer-reviewed study, if I see the results of a clinical trial, I know those are medications or tools or guidelines or processes I can use in my medical job. But if I read an announcement from a company overhyping the importance of AI, if I see the news about certain AI technologies diagnosing patients better than how we physicians can do the same, that's not enough. So it only works through evidence-based medicine. Thank you. Bertalan, uh, please uh, share with us personally what truly inspires you speaking of AI. Wow. Uh, there, is, there are many technologies I'm excited about. Of course, AI stands out. But there is one particular example that, that always makes me feel like science fiction is real. When, uh, when I first used an ultrasound device, that I could just connect to my smartphone and I could literally do an ultrasound examination, just like the one you see in medical offices with, the, with those huge devices on the roller uh, or the cart. I could do the same thing with, with a smartphone connected portable ultrasound device. I felt like my mind was blown, blown away. And then after a few months after this first experiment, I could use a similar portable ultrasound device with AI guidance. It meant that I could do an ultrasound examination of the liver, for example, without having the right skills to do that, because there was AI built into the system and the, and the application tried to guide me through the whole process. But then I felt like this is indeed science fiction. And every time I, I think about the most exciting part of AI, I first I always think about portable ultrasound devices. Please uh, do tell us about the most impressive AI technology. Um, I, I think it's portable ultrasound devices, but what would be really impressive in terms of the big picture changes around healthcare is how AI could take part in, in diagnostics. I'm talking about a whole evolution of examples here, starting from patients using AI to make better decisions about lifestyle insights and health management. Just look at skin vision and how that app helps patients diagnose skin lesions through uh, making photos with their smartphones. So starting with patients and then using AI with, uh, on pathological samples, the way pathologists could make better decisions without even meeting the patients first. Uh, Path AI is a good example for that. The third would be using AI to just flag those cases that require human expertise, but all the rest will be taken care of by that algorithm. I'm talking about Analytic, a company uh, doing, this, doing such algorithms in radiology, and then thinking about those companies that would not even that would develop algorithms for patients, but by not meeting patients, I'm talking about DeepMind here, and how they try to predict the outcome of a patient's story. For example, whether patients staying at the hospital would have a higher chance to develop acute kidney disease in, in the next two days. Imagine how much value it, such an information would mean to their healthcare professionals working at the hospital, thinking that this and that patient would have a higher risk for that disease. So let's dedicate more efforts, more time, more concentration on them. That would be of tremendous value. Bertalan, all new technologies are changing the customer journey and these are changing business models. What is your vision of the new customer journey uh, in the current stage of medicine supported by AI? 
Thank you for the question. Uh, this vision I started building about a decade ago was all around the idea that digital health technologies can make patients the point of care, meaning I could receive diagnosis, monitoring and treatment wherever I am, and that digital health technologies make healthcare globalized, meaning that my healthcare, the quality of life that I have, would not depend so much on my country's healthcare system, but on my individual access to technologies and services worldwide. I know it doesn't sound like an ideal word, but that's what's happening because of AI and digital health-based technology. So my vision now, especially because of the pandemic, would be that I keep on paying taxes in my country and I will receive healthcare in my own country. But whenever I feel like I could find additional value in using digital health or AI-based services, apps, technologies, or companies, which might be located anywhere in the world, I could still get access to them, but it means I would have to pay for them individually. Uh, let's not talk about how this widens the gap between people who can afford a better healthcare and people who cannot. There are some good solutions for that, but let's not take this as the, the, the part of the discussion now. But the, this, this vision is more about the individual's maybe historic opportunity to access better healthcare through the data they can obtain through those technologies, which are borderless and there are no geographical boundaries anymore. Thank you very much, Bertolan. Uh, it is very appreciating to see you on our event. Thank you once again. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. Many thanks for, to, for the invitation. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you.